Um, whenever you're ready, we can hit real quick. Yep. To Software Prize Work Forum. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Ethan Gates. I am a software preservation analyst for Yale University Library um, and the user support lead for the grant funded uh, easy program of work, which is an affiliate project of SPIN. I am also a member of the Software Preservation Network's Community Engagement Collaborative who have um, put together this event today. And our topic is um, building a video game collection, legal considerations for preservation. We're gonna have a round table discussion on building solidarity with uh, related video game organizations and communities to win an improved exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for video games in the United States. Um, my co-facilitators for today um, from the Community Engagement Collaborative include Jacob Zeporowski from the Getty Research Institute, Jess Farrell from Educopia Institute and Community Coordinator for SPIN, Sarah Rue from Wichita State University, Diane Dietrich from Cornell University Library, and Caitlin Perry from Educopia. It takes a village to put these on, so thank you all to, um, to joining in um, and, and making today happen. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation for our, for our speakers um, that you'd like to, to bring up during our discussion, please enter them using our Google form um, that we're going to drop into the chat, or it's available in the running notes um, for today's call as well, the link to the Google form. Um, if we use this form, it lets us keep questions um, and try to um, get answers to them later on for you if we um, don't have time to address them within um, our time for the call today. Um, so we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that and on the chat for questions to bring up during audience Q&A later. Uh, and the SPIN forum is also governed by the SPIN code of conduct. If you are being harassed or see someone being harassed today, um, please notify one of our code of conduct monitors at any time during the call via chat, via direct message. Um, our code of conduct monitors for today are Diane Dietrich and Caitlin Perry. So look out for them um, for, uh, for reports. I think that takes care of our housekeeping though, so I'll just dive right in. Um, we're gonna begin today with a high level overview of today's topic to provide context for our discussion. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act was signed into law in 1998. It bars the creation of quote, technology devices or services intended to circumvent measures that control access to copyrighted works, um, as per Wikipedia, that quote. Um, these measures are commonly referred to as digital rights management or DRM. And the DMCA is subject to a review process that takes place every three years. The most recent review took place um, last year in 2021. And these reviews result um, when these three year processes um, happen, they result in exemptions for anti circumvention of access controls for certain media. In recent years, there's been a growing advocacy for video games to be included in those exemptions um, to allow for long term preservation and access. So our, our discussion today is going to be around why is it important to advocate for this exemption in particular um, and what such an exemption or other you know, legal considerations um, could do um, to expand on video game preservation and access in general. Um, and before I get started, I should say that we, um, we know that in, in the uh, uh, publicity materials and when we sent out everything for the registration for these events that uh, Kendra Albert was included on our panelists today. Unfortunately, they were unable to make it um, at the last minute, according to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we will be working with them absolutely in the future. Obviously, they're a close friend of SPIN. Since Ethan is frozen, I will just say that Brandon Butler is stepping in for Kendra. Um, and we're we'll surely have them. And we'll hold for a minute to see if Ethan um, is able to get back. Can you all hear me? <laughs> now we can, yeah, Ethan. Um, I, I'm just gonna keep that video off okay. for a minute there. <laughs> Apologies all. Um, I, I, it sounded like just uh, uh, mentioned that Brandon has stepped in. Let's keep going with my speaker introductions. Uh, first off, as digital 
curator at The Strong. Andrew Borman um, coordinates the museum's efforts related to digital preservation of electronic games, has long taken an active role in game preservation, focusing on preservation of unreleased game products and development material. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for joining. Thank you. We also to thank you. We also today have Phil Salvador from uh, the Video Game History Foundation, where he is the library director there. Uh, where he manages the foundation's collection of digital and physical materials related to the history of video games. But most importantly, he would like to know that he is a friend to all birds. Thank you, Phil. And finally, we have Brandon Butler, um, who is the direction, Director of Information Policy at the Virginia Law and Policy Advisor, oversees FIN's policy and legal strategy, securing lawful presence, sharing and reuse of software, including um, our previous exam. DMCA for uh, software preservation. So really grateful to have you here today to join the conversation, Brandon. Uh, to start things off, if each of our panelists has prepared a short presentation or, or, or statement on their work and our theme, actually Brandon may not have had time to do this, <laughs> but after basically after five minutes, at least for Andrew and Phil, um, we will move into a moderated discussion between our panelists and then finally aim for about 15 minutes of totally open Q&A from the audience at the top, uh, end of our hour. So I am going to hand things off to Andrew first. Uh, Andrew, if you'd like to take it away. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Borman. I am the digital games curator at The Strong. Uh, so my job is really thinking about our the, the, the digital games that are being created today and the challenges that come with them. We also have an electronics ele electronic games curator who handles many of the physical materials at the museum. But I want to talk a little bit about the museum to give you a size, an idea of the size and the scope of, of work that we're dealing with. Uh, so the Strong is located in Rochester, New York. Uh, we have the most comprehensive collection of material related to play in the world. Uh, so that's everything from toys and dolls to board games, role-playing games, anything that's playful, including, of course, video games. Uh, the museum itself is about 285,000 square feet uh, situated in downtown Rochester. And we're currently in the middle of an expansion that's adding 90,000 square feet. Uh, and that's primarily dedicated to video games, just to give an idea of, of how seriously we're taking video games at the museum. Uh, included in that space are, is a gallery that we're calling Digital Worlds, uh, which includes uh, our high score gallery centered around our World Video Game Hall of Fame. Uh, but then we're also uh, looking to mix things up a little bit with a, a gallery that we're calling Level Up in which case uh, you'll be able to enter a video game, you'll get a wristband that tracks your progress, uh, and you'll get to play many uh, different interactives inspired by the history of video games. Uh, but we are primarily a collections-based museum, uh, and that means that we have over 550,000 objects in the museum. That's everything from the tiniest of doll shoes, doll furniture. I always joke that the, the some of the doll houses that we have are nicer than the apartment that I lived in for many years. Uh, they had electricity, really amazing pieces of work. Uh, but that also includes video games and hardware and, and related materials. So of that 550,000, about 60,000 are related to video games in some some way, including those items. Uh, but also it includes things like uh, accessories, action figures related to video games, and just video game material uh, in the most general sense. Uh, so this lets you really track the history of not just video games, but play. And we feel that creates a, a really comprehensive look about uh, of how people play and, and American culture. Uh, along with those objects, we also have a library that's over 200,000 volumes, I think over 225,000 volumes of books, magazines, trade catalogs, any sort of kind of the usual paper materials that you may be been able to get at trade shows or stores or that sort of thing. But we also have a comprehensive archive uh, that includes, uh, um, for video game content, material from people like Carol Shaw, Brian Fargo, uh, companies like Microsoft, Broderbund, uh, Mech, many huge companies, including uh, what was left of the Atari coin-op division when that shut down, and that came in on a tractor trailer load. Uh, and that includes things like paper. Paper is pretty common uh, up until recently, but also things like floppy disks, uh, all sorts of video material on pneumatic tapes, VHS, beta tapes, you name it. So we're really dealing with a huge variety of formats. Uh, we've had many projects that digitize things, and we'll get into all of this in a little bit. 
Uh, but but the, the key thing to take home is that we allow researchers to view just about anything. Uh, if you wanna look at a prototype game, give us a week or two to set it up and we'll find some way if we can do it uh, of making that happen safely, of course, for free. Uh, we've had over 600,000 guests prior to COVID uh, per year, and we hope to get that up to over a million every year. Uh, we host over 100 researchers in person every year. Of course, not everybody can make it to Rochester. So that's why these conversations are so important to be having, have, because we, we want these materials to be as accessible as possible to the widest group of people possible. Uh, so I think that's enough. It gives you an idea of the scope of work that we're dealing with. Uh, but the fact is that there's a lot, and there's a lot of video game history that is left to be uncovered and even more to make accessible in the near future. Amazing. Thank you, Andrew. I will say that if you all can get to Rochester, it is an amazing experience. I went once, but only had about two hours, and it was nowhere near enough. Um, but No, I... no. I, and you can actually <laughs> look. There's a Google Arts and Culture page that allows you to do a street view of the museum as of a few years ago. So you can go through and see <laughs> two floors of our galleries. Of course, it's not as fun when you don't get to play with these things. Uh, and of course, that doesn't show our storage spaces, including the new one that's being built right now with the expansion. That's well, I'm super excited to uh, explore more remote options for exploring the strongest collection um, in this talk here today. Um, wonderful. I think I'll go next to Phil um, if you want to tell us a bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, so, like uh, Ethan said, uh, my name is Phil. I'm the library director at the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization based in Oakland that is dedicated to uh, preserving and teaching and celebrating the history of video games. Uh, and we, we take a pretty broad look at what that means, but I think we have a really interesting approach to this topic today because uh, the Video Game History Foundation generally doesn't collect video games. Um, when it comes to retail games, games you can get on digital storefronts, uh, we recognize there are folks who are doing that job much better than we could, like the Strong Museum of Play, and we don't want to replicate that work that's going into that. So what we do instead is we try to focus on uh, what one of our co-directors calls, we collect context. We collect the sort of the contextualizing materials that help explain video games. Uh, the goal of our collection being we want to help researchers, YouTubers, storytellers, anyone in that umbrella to help understand the story of a video game. And that can be a whole bunch of things. It can be oftentimes it's press materials, it's video game magazines. I think we have a collection of about 10,000 issues of video game magazines. Um, but relevant to today's topic, a big part of what we do is we collect development materials and source materials for video games. Uh, we have a project we've been doing called the Video Game Source Project, where we're working with folks uh, within the industry, all different sides in museums, in archives, including Andrew, uh, to help uh, understand you know, what to do with these materials. We collect things like uh, source assets. We collect source code, uh, development builds of games in progress. Uh, correspondences between developers. Uh, I think a really great example is that we have the uh, the source code for Disney's Aladdin game for Sega Genesis, and we have some of the uh, original art like that was drawn out for this game. And it's kind of the raw elements of the game itself. And we think that this is the best material for researchers, that if you're trying to study the history of a game, this is like having the raw ingredients of the game. We think it's really powerful and useful for people trying to understand the history of video games. Um, we also understand that it's a little tricky to provide access to these things because, you know, when it's a video game collection, of course, there's copyright issues, but when you start dealing with prototype materials, source code, uh, we often have development tools for games, you start getting into areas like trade secrecy, and that's when things start to get a little stickier for providing access, and we know that there has to be, you know, some controlled secure environment for providing access to these things. I think within the video game community, there's often an expectation that things just end up floating around online. And as a nonprofit organization, that's kind of uh, not an option a lot of the time. Um, so we will have, we're still setting up our, our you know facilities, but we'll have a reading room area where if you want to come study some of this stuff, absolutely you can. But we also realize that's not ideal in a lot of cases. Um, when you're studying video game source material, source code, it's something that takes time. It takes using specialized tools. And it's something that is often, I think, a little bit at odds with sort of the traditional reading room research model. Uh, you know, it's a little prohibitive to ask people to, you know, arrange their life so they can take a week to fly out to Oakland and spend eight hours a day in our like, you know, kind of tiny library room uh, studying the source code for a video game when we know there's other ways we can provide access to this stuff. 
um, we've had in our minds like our pie in the sky idea of we want to find some way to provide remote secure access to these materials in an environment that will let people engage with them like not just you know being able to read source code from a file but being able to use some of the tools that developers worked with at the time using some sort of emulation as a service technology that's kind of been our our end goal like this would be the ideal way to provide access to some of these materials but there's also a lot of uncertainty surrounding that in terms of things like the exemptions we've gotten in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, some uncertainty around how we can apply fair use in these cases. And I think that's what I, I'm interested in talking about today is exploring how those things can be used to provide access to these raw materials that I think would have a, a profound impact on how people study video game history if they were able to have remote access to these things. Thanks. A wonderful introduction. I'm already putting in a question they like us to go around, which is is the source code for a video game a video game? <laughs> uh, but let's 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 say for 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 a few minutes because I do I know I know Brandon we that we didn't necessarily have you know give you time here to prepare remarks, but I do also want to hold space for you um, to speak for a minute or two if you would like on on you know your background and where you're coming at um, this topic from. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, it's it's wonderful to get to uh, speak to you all today about this stuff, and I will try to do justice to what my friend Kendra uh, would have done if they were here. Um, and I'll just say Kendra is the, the head of, uh, or uh, she's a, a supervising attorney at the Harvard um, IP clinic, and the clinic has worked with SPIN for many years now on a, a number of issues, and one of them is the DMCA. So one of the things that I get to do when I work for SPIN is um, sort of uh, coordinate that partnership with the clinic. And I help Kendra and the students sort of represent SPIN and its members and the whole kind of community of, of software and video game preservation uh, experts, you know, represent them well in this uh, DMCA process, which I will now describe. So the um, I think the, the most useful thing for me to do is maybe to say a little bit about copyright in the DMCA and then a little bit about the DMCA process and what we're thinking about for the next cycle. So first about copyright in the DMCA, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is, uh, as Ethan said in his opening sort of remarks, um, a new layer of protection in addition to actual copyright, the, the part of the act that we're concerned with here, it says, regardless of whether the copyright law says what you want to do is okay, if you, what you want to do involves cracking uh, digital rights management, that is still in itself a violation of the law, even if what you do after you do that cracking is lawful. And this was something that was really important to the content industries in the late 1990s. They were really upset and worried about um, the internet and computers. And so they wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, they could actually punish people even for trying to do something that looks like piracy. Um, and so this gave them an extra layer of protection. And I, I notice a lot of folks on the call, or at least a substantial number of folks on the call, who may be outside of the US. And I want to um, mention that this is relevant to you because uh, for good or ill, the way that the United States um, got the Digital Money and Copyright Act into law was in part by, um, they couldn't get it through Congress initially, so they went to the World Intellectual Property Organization, negotiated a treaty at the international level that said, every country that's a part of this treaty promises to enact a law that will protect digital rights management, and then came back to the United States Congress and said, our hands are tied, we just signed a treaty, now we have to pass a law, and so lots of other countries, um, unfortunately, were sort of dragged into this uh, regime of digital rights management, law enforcement, because of US content industry's policy agenda, right? And then ever since then, we have signed multiple little free trade agreements with individual countries and groups of countries where we throw in, just for good measure, a copy of the DMCA, basically, and say, everybody who signs this trade agreement promises also to uh, make it unlawful to crack digital locks. Um, and as is our uh, as is our want in the United States, we we exported all the bad parts of our law and none of the good parts. And so 
we generally told people you should have a DMCA, but you know, the sort of exemption thing that we do, you don't really need that unless you want it, right? And so some countries have a kind of exemptions process uh, that looks like ours, which I'll describe in a minute. Some countries have permanent exemptions that are in the law, but they can't ever be modified or updated or changed. And then some countries have no exemptions. Um, so that's where things get interesting internationally is in those contrasts. But, but in any event, knowing about digital rights management and, and the fact that the law can, can create additional problems for you is I think relevant for kind of most people in the world for good or ill, because it's a thing that everybody jumped on that train with us back in the late 90s. So what does all this mean? Well, so copyright, within the software preservation network, that was one of the first things that we did as a policy agenda item was to help get our hands around copyright and software preservation. And we talked about together within the community in the US portion of SPIN, fair use. And so we were able to establish a set of, of norms around software preservation and copyright grounded in the United States fair use doctrine, right? And that again is a thing that in other countries you could look to kind of uh, adapt and adopt. So I know that in Canada, efforts are underway now. Um, they're quite far along to create a kind of Canadian version because the Canadian fair dealing provision is, is so similar to fair use, right? So once you know that your activity is sort of not a violation of copyright period, right? Old, good old fashioned pre-1998 copyright, it may be the case, in fact, it is not unlikely that software, especially video games, will have a kind of digital rights management uh, element to it, right? A, a, a code you have to enter in order to decrypt the file that would be a, a key, right? Or an authentication server that you have to ping and say, you know, I promise this is a lawful copy and that server will say, okay, we'll let you run the software, right? So even though what you want to do is fair and lawful in the United States, for example, if you have to break one of these mechanisms, for example, because the server doesn't exist anymore because the software is so old, well, then you've done something that the law says you can't do, even though what you, even though your, your preservation is fair, the breaking the lock is not, right? So that's why we have to go and every three years, the Copyright Office administers this kind of rulemaking procedure where communities, we are, to be honest, and I say this a lot, but I, I say it because it's true, we are the favored children of copyright in terms of our ability to do things with copyrighted works, it is libraries, archives, you know, cultural heritage institutions. We, we are favored by fair use, we are favored by other parts of the act, and in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the purpose of this every three-year proceeding was mostly to protect us. Um, it was to ensure, it's in the law, that research, education, criticism, those core purposes are not being unduly burdened by the Digital Money and Copyright Act. So every three years we can go to the Copyright Office and basically say, we are unduly burdened. You know, this is bad. It's not working. It's not working well for us. It's preventing us from doing lawful stuff. And so that's what we've done. Every three years we've gone and we've made the case and we've, and we've done a good job, I think. We've won increasingly broad exemptions that make it clear that when we're engaged in good faith preservation of software, then we can break digital locks to do that. But the contours of those exemptions are important, right? And one of the most important contours is once you've done that breaking of the lock and you've preserved the software, who can see it and how and where, right? And so in the last cycle, having lived through a global pandemic, we were able to say with a straight face, maybe forcing people to go to buildings is not good. You know, maybe having a premises requirement that says, if you wanna do research, you have to go to Rochester um, is maybe not ideal. And maybe we need to enable people to do research remotely from wherever they are. And the Copyright Office agreed with us for non-game software. But when it came to video games, the Entertainment Software Association, our good friends in the industry, argued that you know libraries were going to be unfairly competing with commercial uh, video game offerings. Right, this would be a kind of free online arcade. We were going to put the Nintendo Switch out of business 
by putting, you know, um, uh, vintage video games into a research collection that people could, could access. So that's where we are now. We cannot make remote access to video games available under the current DMCA rule if the video game, if you had to crack a lock. If you didn't have to crack a lock, then the DMCA stuff is all irrelevant to you. You can rely on fair use. And I don't wanna chill that behavior. You, you can, I argue, and we could talk about the details and I'm not your lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. But you could do remote access if you didn't have to crack a digital lock. But the rule about cracking digital locks is very clear. If you had to crack a lock, then you can only provide access on the premises. And that's where we are. That's the thing we need to fight about in the next cycle, which is going to come up again in two years. So we got the last set of rules last year, 2021. And so the next set of rules will come out in 2024. And so that, that proceeding will begin next year and we will make our case. So that's part of what we can talk about today. How do we make that case? What do the needs look like and, and so on? But that's the, that's the basic groundwork of where we are. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon, for walking us through these very complicated policies and processes as always in a you know super accessible way that makes clear the impact, I think, of, of what happens when, uh, when these complicated international policies trickle down to the level of you know, organizational policy and collections access. I, I wonder if on that vein, we can transition into our sort of roundtable discussion with the three of you. Phil and Andrew, especially, I'm, I'm curious, sort of jumping up off from where Brandon just left us with, you know, the sort of the current state of what you can and can't do <laughs> preservation access wise in terms of, you know, okay, let's say you can offer remote access to anything without digital locks, but you can't <laughs> offer remote access to anything with a digital lock. Do you, are you all even prepared to sort of apply those principles to your collections? I guess this is a, a an interesting question about the current state of preservation and access. Can you make those distinctions or is this sort of what you're still teasing out? I'll jump in. Uh, so, so I think part of what we're dealing with uh, with any institution is is just institutional comfort in doing things. So, so it's one thing to be able to, but it, but it's another knowing that you know many of us that are collecting video games and making them accessible to the public are nonprofits. You know, even when something is legal, that doesn't mean there there isn't a cost involved potentially to get everybody else on board and to uh, to just be comfortable doing that. That said, you know, I, I've been lucky since uh, about August last year, I've been building out a new digital preservation lab uh, at the Strong, and that includes things to back up cartridges, CDs, all sorts of formats, make them accessible on site, uh, but also investing just a little bit into computer uh, architecture to, to someday allow that remote access of materials. Uh, one of the challenges that that we've had internally as we're starting to think about these things is how how can we best still protect you know any sort of copyright concerns knowing that especially the strong we're working with the companies like Microsoft Nintendo's anybody of that world we don't want to be seen as a a uh, an organization that's going to simply help others build their collection of copyrighted materials that's a request that we often get. Uh, for example, we found one of the only copies of, of Super Mario Brothers 3 made by what became id Software that they made as a prototype in a recent donation. That's great. And we, we've made that accessible on site, no problem. But, but some of the requests we're getting, and it's hard to filter through, is then like, we're, we're not here to build your collection. I, I understand you want to play it, you want to research it understandable but but there's people that are asking you know I, I would love to have a copy of this for my collection that that's one issue that we're dealing with but there's also just you know anytime we're dealing with any sort of assets whether it's paper on site or not source code prototype builds we still have our image use policies and so how we ultimately we would need to enforce those policies when it comes up, how, how far are we willing to go? And that gets back to that institutional comfort of even, you know, I, I can back things up. 
that that's easy. I can tell you how to play them in an emulator, play them on original hardware. But once somebody then goes outside of the, the, the realm of their image use, it starts getting more complicated. And I, I think that's where, you know, finding the comfort levels of different institutions is going to come into play, regardless of how quickly the law catches up to things we want to be doing. Um, going off what Andrew said, uh, I think, yeah, comfort level, I feel like is a more pressing issue immediately than making, I think, the distinction between you know, what we can and can't do under current exemptions. Um, the Video Game History Foundation is interesting because uh, we generally come from like the, the folks who I work with, Frank Savaldi and Kelsey Lewin, come from the video game industry and the video game community. Uh, I'm sort of the first person involved who's coming from a library and museums background. So it's interesting to see what the different expectations are like from you know, coming from that end about, you know, wanting to promote access to things. I think uh, I, I want to quote uh, Dr. Ro uh, <clears throat> Doc, excuse me, Dr. Bo Ruberg, uh, who uh, mentioned this at the last DMCA hearing that we think of it the same way that like preservation and access are synonymous for us, that we, we are generally, we are digital first, we want to be accessed first, but realize that there's cases where we're not really sure what we can do. Um, some of it is because, uh, frankly, some things we get, it's like, wow, we have the, you know, all this material from this game that, you know, fell off the back of a truck and there's less clear rules about like when things come anonymously through people, what you can do to promote access to it. Um, but we'll also get things from developers who will say, oh yeah, here, you know, do what you want with it. And it's like partial development builds of retail games. And it's like, we probably can't put this on the internet. So a lot of it is navigating those kind of questions. I think in talking about institutional comfort, we generally, I think, lean more towards the access side of things in terms of what we want to do. And we realize that that's kind of, you know, different institutions have different priorities and different approaches to it. Um, in terms of the digital locks question, I think uh, to the extent that it, we think about it, uh, again, because we're not dealing with retail software, we're not really thinking about that as much. But because we're still working with things like development environments, there's a lot of things that I really don't know how the, is it, you know, copy protected or not, how those apply to it. Um, thinking of a, a specific recent example, um, we were donated a source code by a developer who passed away who had uh, an in-progress build of an old Nintendo game, which we were able to uh, recompile and make available, which was exciting. But the compiler we had to use, I think they found it from like a somewhat sketchy website that had like the source code leak for a digital thermometer that happened to use the same compiler as this old Nintendo game. So a lot of the times we're dealing with things in this very unusual territory where even putting aside any questions about like, have we obtained this legitimately? It's like, it's very difficult for some of these things to figure out like what kind of copy protection are we breaking if we're working with 30 year old software that was very hardware dependent. Like a lot of those things I think are a little unsettled for us to a degree that it's difficult to apply uh, DMCA specific interpretations of whether or not we can provide remote access to it. Uh, so besides just institutional comfort levels and working with donors, I think that's also for us a question, not working with retail things, is it's kind of unclear where and how that applies in some cases. Just to add, add a little bit to that as well, you know, for us, we're, we're concerned about breaking DRM. You know, I've actually written a blog post look, looking at a game, Tron Evolution, what it takes to even get into a game when the, the authentic, authentication servers go down. Uh, so, and we, we do have a large collection of retail games, but, but in terms of priority, our priority has been backing up, uh, you know, the unique artifacts that we can't go to eBay and buy another thing for, uh, if it should not work. So, you know, if that floppy disk fails and, you know, if you're know anything about floppy disk, you're looking at 20 to 25 years of pretty good, uh, stability in terms of data. Uh, you start doing the math nineties, you know, 30 years ago to make us all feel old. You know, you don't feel good about that. So there's a prioritization that's happening too. But also just to add to what Phil was saying in terms of like build environments and everything, we also know that there's complicated contracts when you're dealing with voice actors. That's a whole different story, especially voice actors who maybe were uh, uh, just auditioning for a role. You know, I have plenty of auditions for, uh, let's say, a Silent Hill game, for instance. Can I make those accessible? Music is a whole nother deal. You know, it's it's one thing to to deal with the the immediate game things that we know. Okay, Microsoft has the rights to this. Do they have the rights to the middleware? Do they have the rights to the export plugins? Like, it starts to get very complicated very quick. Uh, but I, I do think we're prepared to deal with those issues. Uh, but again, prioritization and comfort. 
Yeah, just to, to bounce off what Andrew said too, I think that's, when you think about like, can we preserve a video game or a video game materials? I think that quickly becomes, can we preserve these 100 other things of varying levels of mediums? And like, it's never compact unless it's like, you know, a Super Nintendo game. Like it's never a compact thing with easy rules to apply to it. Um, and then what does preservation mean? I know that's not the topic today, but if you check out the link I dropped in the chat, you know, preservation is more than the retail game, obviously. We're, we're talking a lot about source code and development materials. It's more than that. You know, it's public reaction. It's the magazines. It's everything. Video game preservation is huge, <laughs> but even when we're just dealing with software, there are so many challenges. Well, geez Louise, guys. Um... <laughs> <laughs> How do you preserve the universe? That's the, uh, the question we really got to. Yeah, yeah. He well, has to actively we actively preserve something. Things can, are not preserved, and then we wash our hands and say, "Ah, we're done." <laughs> I, I, if if you don't mind, I'm sorry. To, I don't mean to cut you off, Brandon, but I can, if I can jump in, I'm I'm curious about a point that kind of you touched on, Phil, which is like capacity, and like it, you're both talking about like very thorny, very complicated questions that like you have to sift through sometimes at the at the item level to figure out: Can we share this? Can we share that? Can we break the lock here? Can we break the lock there? I mean, uh, Phil, you're working at an organization with three people on staff. Andrew, I'm not sure how big the the strong is, but but bigger than that. I mean, what would change on like a like what would these processes look like when they trickle down to your organization? That is to say, like if we got the exemption tomorrow, I mean, what would what would change for your day to day? Like, how would you all at your in your context go about shifting your policies or rethinking um, your 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 efforts, whether we call it preservation, whether we call it access, whatever we're calling it. Well, we're in kind of a, a nice place for that if it happened tomorrow, because we are still, I'm on like month five of this job. So we are still in the process of like setting up our digital preservation platform. So uh, we're at a place now that we could, we could design things around it, but capacity is a huge issue. Like you said, um, you know, a year ago or like a year and a half ago, there was one full-time person at the Video Game History Foundation. Now there's three. And we have a lot of stuff that we're not sure what to do with because we just, we have things. Like our focus has been, I think uh, Frank and Kelsey have said, uh, it's to stop the bleeding and fix the future is kind of where we are. So at this point, it's get things, we can figure out what to do with them later. And uh, the later has arrived and now it's me. Um, I think internally we keep saying, every time something like that comes up, they say, oh, that's a fill problem. So now it's my problem to deal with. Um, and I realized that's not, you know, sustainable over time. The hope is the organization can continue growing. But yeah, when it comes to thorny things like this, like how do we deal with the rights around the source code for a digital thermometer when it comes to things like that, we kind of don't have the capacity to deal with it. And I think even if we got the exemptions, like right now, I think there's still so many outstanding questions that it would still be a while before we can implement things. I remember uh, one of the exemptions that we got during the last, I think it was the last cycle in 2018, it was for more digital lock breaking on games that have to, you know, phone home to a remote server to be activated. Things like Tron Evolution, as Andrew Borman mentioned. Um, and I think even immediately coming after that, outside of the strong, there weren't a lot of institutions immediately working with that because a lot of the time it's like, you know, if it's a game collection at a library, it's part of like a broader media collection, right? There's a couple of universities that have larger collections of things, but there often isn't I don't want to speak for everybody, but I feel like the existence of a dedicated staff person who handles digital preservation for software materials is limited to a small handful of institutions. So even now having a full-time librarian with the foundation, um, I think it's, it's the kind of thing where it, right now I'm putting all my energy into like processing one collection of things. I think figuring out, you know, what can and can't we do with these exemptions, um, just the timeline on that is is long having only one person working at that. But Andrew, to pass to you, obviously you have more capacity for dealing with these kind of things than we do yeah. right now. Right, and I'm on year five, but but you know, with a larger employment base at the strong, we also have more stuff, which means there's more and there's more of everything. Uh, so I already mentioned, we're building our capacity in our lab to actually be able to do things at least. You know, if you look at the top 15 console platforms, I can back those up. Beyond that is a different story. Uh, so, I, I mean, the, the ultimate solution to any of this is if it happened tomorrow, we would have to find a way to hire more people. And that's something we're already working on. You know, one of the downsides to not being a dedicated video game museum is that there are other materials, you know, there's material related to board games. So our archivist 
uh, is already working so hard to process collections, but we're bringing in pallets of material every year. So it can be really hard to get ahead of that just to deal with physical collections without adding digital collections on top of that or digitized collections. Uh, one of the things that we've done really well is found local grants that help us digitize things and you know start off some of these things, uh, some of these projects. I dropped a, a link to Preservica, our, our personal digital collections at the Strong portal that has some of the materials we've been able to digitize and make public. Those are great. You know, we have copyright for those sorts of things. So that, that part is easy. But we're still sitting on, you know, terabytes of data that, yes, we're, we're following industry standards to back things up, remote backup, all of that. But we want to be doing more. We want to be using Preservica more. But there's a cost involved with that. And it's a cost that uh, will continue from now until the end of time, essentially, the same as a building cost would have. Uh, so, yes, you know, as all of our materials increase, as do the needs for people. Uh, you know, I can personally back things up, but then I'm also working on exhibits. I'm also working on videos. I'm working on all these other things. So, so the, the amount of time we have to dedicate to just digital preservation in general, you know, is a fraction of, of our, our typical work week. Uh, so we already have plans. We, we, we are looking at, you know, how do we get a digital uh, asset manager? Do we get a specific digital archivist? Do we, do we look at uh, you know, somebody whose goal is just uh, to digitize things. Can we work with interns? Are there security issues? All of that are things that are, you know, we've been working on, we continue to work on. But again, if you add remote access tomorrow, uh, it, it starts to become difficult because we're already doing a lot with remote access of the materials that we can provide access to. You know, we have scanners, we have all this other equipment, we have the ability to do things. But there's a lot of requests, there's a lot of people researching play. And whether it's us or organizations like the Video Game History Foundation or anybody else, this is a collective effort. Uh, you know, none of us can do it all by ourselves. We need support, uh, whether that's support of just people like you who come to chats like this, uh, where we can talk about these issues, or you know, come to a museum. You know, support the Video Game History Foundation. Do what you can to support us because ultimately that will uh, paint a much more complete picture of video game and software preservation. Um, if I could, oh, let's, Brandon, let's, Brandon, go on. Right. Get Brandon in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me jump in with a couple of, I have a couple of things um, I wanted to throw into the conversation. So one is that the nice thing about fair use and one of the reasons I love it because I'm a simple guy and I don't, I, I, I like simple solutions. And the nice thing about fair use is that if your use is fair, it really doesn't matter who owns the thing that you're using. It really doesn't matter um, typically where it came from, unless you've signed something somewhere, you know, that's the only kind of origin story that makes me nervous when I hear, you know, uh, well, we don't, we don't really know where this came from. Well, you know, that's okay. If it fell, if it literally fell off a truck, fair use actually honestly is, is, is not worried about that, uh, believe it or not. Um, and so, uh, so I just want to put in a word in favor of fair use as actually really a powerful tool. And, the best practices, one of the things that um, that we've always done, so there are right more than a dozen of these kinds of fair use best practices documents. And one of the things that they do, in addition to just sort of giving you, you know, some legal ideas, is that they they have been built on a kind of community conversation. And so what you can do with these documents is you can tell your your bosses, your lawyers, your whoever, not only like, this is not Brandon Butler's opinion about what's legal or Kendra Alberts or Peter Yazzie's, like this was actually a three year grant that was built on conversations like, like these with folks like you all and where we talked about what is legitimate, what is fair, what is normal, what is important to the field, right? And so, so my hope is if you, if, if you are having these conversations, one thing you can do out there in, in, in the practice is refer to the best practices as a kind of declaration of, you know, norms. Like this is actually, this is our normal belief. Like this is what we all think we should be doing. So hopefully that will be helpful. So consider that that's one thing you can do with the best practices. And, and again, consider that fair use will cover, you know, your thermometer decompiler, everything you need to do 
um, behind the scenes, as well as, you know, the, the stuff that you then ultimately put out in the world. But then I wanted to point out, there's this amazing dynamic and it's playing out in this conversation and it plays out throughout the DMCA in every, with everyone who needs the DMCA to be changed, this dynamic repeats itself. And I will now, uh, Andrew mentioned, you know, the 1990s might make you all feel old um, and me too. And uh, I'll now reference Bill and Ted, excellent adventure. Um, we are in the same situation as Bill and Ted. We need Eddie Van Halen to give us guitar lessons so that we can be excellent guitarists so that our band can have an excellent video. But Eddie Van Halen will not give us guitar lessons until we have an excellent video, right? You're in that circle or, you know, the, uh, the um, Alice Cooper, you know, I can't get a job because I don't have a car. I can't get a car because I don't have a job, right? We can't show that we need an exemption because we don't have one. So we're not building the tools and the infrastructure and the services that would take advantage of it because we're scared that we would break the law if we did that, right? And so we're in this position of going every, and this has happened, this is, this is not just y'all, it's, uh, it's documentary filmmakers, it's everybody who goes in. You always start from a position where you have been making life work so far under the fear of the legal consequences that might attach. And so you just don't try things. And so you can't say, well, here's all the things we would do if we got the rule tomorrow, because you've sort of built a system that doesn't need the rule, right? And so we have a real hard time, um, you know, making these arguments and it's not a coincidence. It's kind of a, a part of the way the whole thing works all the time for everyone. But at least for me, my strategy is to try to take legal concerns off the table as a reason why we we are not able to do things. And there's other reasons, you just heard a lot of them, right? Why we can't do everything we'd like to do. But I, I, I would like for us to, as a community, to be able to say, the law isn't one of those reasons. So that's fine, we won't, we're not gonna do this because we don't have the personnel or we don't have the infrastructure or whatever, but but I but if we win these exemptions, if we declare our rights in under fair use, then we can take the law out of the equation as a as a blocker, and that at least makes it a little more likely that we'll get to do the things we want to do. That's I'm, sorry. So, go go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, just for like, I'm just going to point out that we need to. I really want to kick it to some audience questions. Yeah. So thank so, you. So yeah. real quick, uh, you know, uh, we talked a lot about what we're not doing, but I, I do want to make clear that we are also doing a lot. You know. I talked about projects. We backed up over 5,000 archival floppy disks, 100 of pneumatic tapes. We're, we're building those capacity and we are doing things. Uh, but but even when somebody comes to research a retail game, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to back them up. So, you know, we're, we're using those fair use arguments already in the museum. And it's more of the remote access bit that gets to being difficult because, you know, that, that is a whole different issue. But we're doing things. We, we, we recognize that if we want our collection to survive, to the point where remote access and other forms of access are possible, we need to be doing the work now. And that goes for games being created today. Uh, you know, floppy disks, CDRs, all that are a worry and we're, we're dealing with that. But digital games today have their own host of issues that, that we, we can get into another day, but we're also focused on those. You know, there's a bit in between where I, I feel like we have a few years to deal with it, but we're, we're doing things. So I don't want people to, to walk away feeling like, oh, there's nothing being done. Let's, let's give up. We're, we're doing a lot. <laughs> No, and it's about building the pace, right? Like in the capacity, again, we're going back to that question, like the infrastructural pieces that will let us keep up with the frantic pace at which people are creating stuff. <laughs> um, so yes, I definitely want to uh, include, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to kick it to a few audience questions. And the first one that came in is a fun one, so I definitely will, uh, want to give some time to address it. Um, what if any, this is Joshua asks, what if any event in gaming history inspired you to become an advocate for video game preservation? Uh, for Joshua, it was Konami and the PT demo, which if I, as an outside observer, know my game history, that was a very popular um, game demo for a game that was never released and then the demo itself got pulled from online stores. <laughs> uh, 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 so it was, was there some particular inciting incident like that for, for you all that um, got you interested in this field? Sure. First off, we, we've backed up PT at the museum, so we, we've got that going for us. Uh, but for me, it's unreleased games. Specifically, it's Resident Evil uh, 2. Uh, if you know anything about Resident Evil, there's a different version of Resident Evil 2. It's still at Leon, but at Elsa instead of Claire. You know, that version would end up being canceled. The game would be retooled. You know, 
I didn't have a ton of money growing up. I carried around the same magazine for years. You know, I, I finally got a chance to rent the game and play it. Then the game was totally different than what was in the magazine. That's just showed me that games are a process. They don't just show up on the shelves, even though that was back 97 or so. So I was nine years old. Uh, already, that's kind of what kicked it off. And then from there, you know, Propeller Arena was canceled for, after 9-11. Uh, Half-Life on Dreamcast was canceled. Dreamcast was a big deal. And then I got into Xbox, canceled games. You know, there's a story there and there's a human story there beyond the games that I find to be interesting. Uh, I think for me, the inciting incident was I'm very interested in like CD-ROM games from the 1990s, like point and click adventures, educational games, especially. And the state of availability for those things was very, very bad a few years ago. It's still pretty bad now. But in like, you know, 2009 in college, feeling nostalgic, I was like, huh, this is weird that you can't get any of these things. And I started looking around and it's like, oh, yeah, teams produce these things. These stories are complicated. And I think that's what pushed me from being someone who just played games to someone who was thinking more consciously about where they came from, why you can't get them today, and so forth. I'll give a very quick, the thing <laughs> yeah. that got me interested, by the way, is so uh, the thing that got me interested in preservation and copyright was not a video game story, but actually it's the story of the silent movies and the fact that the movie studios would just throw the movies in the ocean when they were done, like just thousands of movies, you know, most of the movies from the silent era are gone forever because their commercial life was, you know, about a year and a half and the copyright life was a century. So I've been fascinated with that disconnect ever since. And that's what kind of motivates me in this space. I come from a similar audiovisual film preservation background. So <laughs> definitely was also my entry point into, into this field. Um, our next question, thank you all. Uh, Rihanna asks, given the copyright for video game and from libraries for video game collab, especially for academic or specialized museum, more specifically, what is the infrastructure do you need to have advocated for beforehand? I think this is, uh, we, we can circle back to some of our questions around advocacy and capacity here. Sorry, we, we missed some of that. Okay. Yeah. Just Paste it in chat. Uh, well, I, I think we, we've uh, dealt with some of the issues surrounding, you know, how do we make movies accessible decades ago in, in libraries and museum settings? Uh, I think the, the first thing is just have somebody who's interested, whether that's patrons or our staff. Staff go a long way. You know, I've seen many library collections get built out of just, you know, there's a gamer on staff. We need video games. It's what people want. It's access to information. Uh, so in terms of library, you know, I, I think it just makes sense. But Phil, I know you also worked in library dealing with similar things. Yeah, at my previous institution there, we had tried to generate interest in building a game collection. And we have one to support like board game programs. But there wasn't so much interest in video games. I think a combination of not being used, but technical expertise and things like that. I think it's often seen as being a very ancillary and like fun thing as opposed to like a scholarly collection. Uh, the Video Game History Foundation has been interesting because, you know, we don't need to convince anyone within our organization that matters. Everyone who's a stakeholder here is already convinced video games matter and that takes down some barriers. Our, what we've noticed is that it tends to be a lot, and this can be other libraries too, outside stakeholders I think need convincing to an extent. You see a lot of stats about how like video games are a bigger industry than movies or music or something like that. And I think a lot of that is this constant uphill battle to prove to external stakeholders that video games are interesting and do matter. Um, I think that's something that when it comes to like donors, like monetary donors and sponsors, that's kind of an issue too. Like I know you more like you, your museum, Andrew, focuses on a broader, uh, you know, panoply of play versus preserving the history of video games, I think attracts different interest areas. I think there just is a tendency for these things to not be taken seriously at a level that requires either continued advocacy or finding your network that already knows and cares about these things. A lot of our support comes from small donors in the community who are already convinced that video games matter. Um, so I think it's just a matter of which approach you're taking. Not that it's binary, but. But, but I do think a lot of those professional organizations and grant making uh, organizations are already supporting video games. I, I think the conversation, even in the five years I've been doing it, I know speaking to my colleagues in the 10, 15 years they've been doing it, 
it's less about why video games now and more about why this project just like anything else there's still going to be the doubters on, on any of these committees that are going to really push back against any video game thing it would have been the same for for any sort of media anyway so that's going to still happen but you know we've had a lot of success with it with huge organizations like the NEH uh, providing us grants for some of our big expansion projects. Uh, we're really fortunate uh, that we have the history to be able to do that, but I know it's, you know, lots of, of smaller organizations are having success too. So I do think that narrative has changed, especially as people like us uh, are out there doing it and are in those organizations now. Um, if I can say one thing real quick for the next question, I see a lot of questions in chat about like specific, are you working with like, you know, a pirated game like modifications or like specific kinds of hardware. One thing I want to say really quick is I think this is where uh, relationships with the video game history community matter. Uh, there are folks who are doing this stuff outside of institutions. And they're doing a great job. And like, we're not trying to replicate what the Strong's doing. I think in a lot of cases, we trust and build on what these people are doing and depend on their hyper-specific interests. Uh, video game preservation isn't just one discipline. It's like 300 different disciplines. Um, so I'm really happy to, to work with these folks and build on what they are doing because uh, with three full-time people, we can't focus on so many things at once. Yeah, and, and we're the same way. You know, we look to the speedrunning community. We look to these other communities. We want to work with them. We want to support them. We want to, if the the our, the goal is to have a final home in the museum, we're happy to support that as well. Uh, we need those people that are hyper interested in things because, you know, like a library, we're dealing generally with a lot of things, but it's the people who want to use things that are going to impact what the collections are now and what they're going to be 100 years from now. Um, all right, I think I'm going to wrap us up now uh, with just a couple of minutes left. I don't think we have time to answer any more questions, but I know there are probably some more questions there in the forum. So we'll definitely share those with the speakers afterwards and see if there's uh, anything more that we wanna do with those or anything more that we can uh, do around those. Thank you all so much for engaging today. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. I learned so much. I had a lot of fun in the chat. <clears throat> um, and yeah, thank you all for attending. So we'll send out um, a recording to everyone who RSVP um, and that will be publicly available. So you'll be able to share it with anyone you like. Um, and we hope to have more conversations uh, on this topic and many other things that came up today soon. So please, uh, please keep in touch with SPIN and we'll see you for the next one. Thank you, everybody.